Dear friends, welcome to Invest. In this video, let's discuss about 20th and 21st October 2021 daily current affairs useful for your UPSC, KPSC and all other competitive exams. Let's see the index of today's discussion. So first article is about uh, airport launch at Kushinagar and it connects to Sri Lanka and many other nations. So this uh, launch is uh, not merely seen as a pilgrimage or tourism importance. This has a way bigger you know, significance that is to establish geopolitical relations for India because on the wake of uh, rising influence, so this is one of the important moves by India. Let's see how it is uh, going to impact our geopolitical relations. So with this, the second article, China denies testing hypersonic missile. So in the previous video, we saw that uh, you know China tested hypersonic missile, but now they deny that they have not done any such testing. So article number three, trade talks between India, Israel to resume. So let's see what are all the important points under discussion in this bilateral, bilateral talks. Article number four, India, Israel, UAE, US launch quad forum. So let's see the significance of this pro forum because we already have quadrilateral uh, association with uh, US, Japan and Australia that is actually for strategic dialogue. So let's see for what purpose this quadrilateral forum is established. Article number five, European Union food recall linked to genetically modified rice from India. So this allegation is of greater significance to India because India is one of the largest exporters of rice. It is this allegation might impact our uh, export. So let's see what India actually clarified about this particular allegations. So with this, let's move on to the article number one, Kushinagar connects to Sri Lanka. So the Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, declares open the Kushinagar International Airport in Uttar Pradesh on October 20. This airport is expected to provide seamless connectivity to tourists from Sri Lanka, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, China, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, and so on. So all the countries that we have mentioned here are actually where Buddhism is actually practiced. Now let's see what is the importance of Kushinagar. Kushinagar is the center of the Buddhist circuit, which consists of pilgrimage signs at Lumbini, Saranath, and Gaya. So if you look at the map here in UP, Uttar Pradesh, we have Kushinagar here. On either side, we have Buddhist places. Like here, we have Lumbini, we have Saranath on the downside, and both Gaya. And Kushinagar is considered to be the center of Buddhist circuit. Now, what do you mean by circuit? Circuit is the link of common places of common importance. So all the places that we are seeing here, like Kushinagar, Lumbini, Saranath, or Gaya, they are of the common importance that is Buddhist places. So that's why they are made together as one particular circuit. Now, why Kushinagar is considered here? Because Buddhist pilgrims uh, consider Kushinagar a sacred site where they believe Gautama Buddha delivered his last ceremony and attained Mahaparinirvana or salvation. So this is the place believed to be Buddha's place of last ceremony. So that is the reason why this is considered as the center of the Buddhist circuit. Uh, to mark the occasion, Sri Lanka will present to India photographs of uh, two murals painted by renowned Sri Lankan artist Solias Mendes at the Kelaniya Rajamaha Vihara, a popular Buddhist temple near Colombo. So one of the paintings, one of the murals uh, depicts, you know, Arahat Bhikkhu Mahinda, Arahat Bhikkhu Mahinda, son of Emperor Ashoka. So he's actually the son of Emperor Ashoka delivering the message of the Buddha to King Devanam Piyas Titsa of Sri Lanka. So it is depicted in one of the paintings. Now, what is there in other painting? The other uh, shows the arrival of their uh, bikuni, you know, uh, is uh, Sangamitta, the daughter of the emperor in Sri Lanka, bearing a sapling of the sacred Bodhi tree under which Siddhartha Gautam is believed to have obtained enlightenment. So other painting where uh, the bikuni, that is uh, Sangamitta, actually carrying the sapling of the sacred Bodhi tree under which Buddha is believed to you know, obtain his uh, enlightenment. So these two paintings of uh, murals that will be uh, gifted to India on this occasion. So now the gesture comes at the time when Sri Lanka and India have agreed to strengthen ties through their shared Buddhist heritage. In the decade after the you know, civil war, which uh, coincides with uh, China's growing influence, 
New Delhi seems keen on recasting its image as a friend using religious and cultural diplomacy. So this is basically, as I told you, not just pilgrimage or tourism. This is actually to have greater relations with our, you know, neighboring countries where uh, similar Buddhism is practiced. So if you see here, uh, they have uh, established China have has established string of pearl routes. That is uh, the you know seaports they have built uh, starting from Hong Kong here. You can see all dotted lines here. So Hong Kong through South China Sea, then uh, Cambodia, then we have at uh, you know uh, Myanmar Chittagong of Bangladesh, then we have Hombantota of Sri Lanka, then uh, Malay in Maldives, then uh, uh, coming to Pakistan at Gwadar. Then we have at uh, Port Sudan, etc. So all the dotted lines uh, here, you can see they have established a uh, strong, uh, you know, communication links. So this is uh, one of the ways to actually kind of uh, having relationship with respect to Sri Lanka. So we have, you know, established or launched the airport that connects uh, uh, kind of uh, Buddhism, uh, you know, places across the world. So now. Uh, the Union Minister for Culture and Tourism, Sri G. Krishna Reddy, will address the inaugural se session of the conference. The two, two days conference will have sessions which will highlight Buddhist circus, circuit and Buddhist uh, tourism. And uh, let's see India and Buddhism and its importance. India has a rich ancient Buddhist heritage with several important sites associated with the life of Lord Buddha. So Buddhist tourism has tremendous potential to draw Buddhism believers from across the world to India, the land of Buddha. The Indian Buddhist heritage is one of the greatest interest of the followers of Buddhism all over the world. And uh, Kushinagar is one of the major pilgrimage centers for Buddhism followers from all over the world. Lord Buddha attained uh, Mahaparinirvana in Kushinagar. It is one of the most important archaeological sites in India. The prime tourist attraction in Kushinagar includes the ancient, uh, ancient uh, Mahaparinirvana temple, one of the most sacred shrines of uh, for Buddhists, you know, Rampar Stupa, then Kushinagar Museum, Sun Tem Temple, Nirvana Stupa, then uh, Mata Kaur uh, Shrine, then Wat Thai Temple, Chinese Temple and Japanese Temple. Buddhism plays a vital role in socio culture and political life of several major Asian partners, as well as in strategically located border areas of India, such as Arunachal Pradesh, Ladakh, and uh, Sikkim. Uh, therefore, Buddhism is not merely a pilgrimage or tourism or economic interest, but also of profound geopolitical significance for India. So as I told you, it is not just for the sake of pilgrimage, tourism, or economical interest, but it is also going to help us a profound uh, geopolitical significance for India. It is believed that around 535 million people around the world practice Buddhism, which would represent between 8 to 10 percentage of the world's total population. So that's actually a good number with respect to number of people you know, practicing Buddhism. So India has been uh, attracting uh, pilgrims, monks, and uh, you know scholars for studying Buddhism from across the world. And there is a huge potential of uh, India's Buddhist heritage for tourism, and also as an instrument for strengthening relations with other countries, especially with uh, predominantly Buddhist countries. So Ministry of Tourism, in collaboration with various central ministries and state governments of Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, is developing Buddhist circuit across circuit across the Buddhist destinations in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. The major uh, verticals of developments under the Buddhist circuit are connectivity, infrastructure and logistics, cultural research, heritage and education, public awareness, communication and outreach. So these are the major verticals of development. So Ministry of Tourism undertakes development of infrastructure at tourist uh, destinations across the country under its infrastructure development scheme, namely Swadesh Darshan, that is in short called as ST and Prashad. So National Mission on Pilgrimage, Rejuvenation and Spiritual Heritage Augmentation Drive. Now let's see these two particular schemes. So under both the schemes, various uh, you know, projects in Buddhist uh, related sites, destinations across India has been sanctioned. So let's see, there's one more uh, point to be added here that is called as 
Abhidhamma day at uh, you know Mahaparinirvana temple in Kushinagar. Now let's see what do you mean by Abhidhamma day. The program was organized by the Union Culture Ministry in collaboration with the International Buddhist Confederation and State Government of Uttar Pradesh. The Abhidhamma day marks the end of three month rainy retreat. Actually, they, they, the monks actually follow three months rainy retreat. So that is called as, uh, you know, Varshavas or Vasa for the Buddhist monks and nuns during which time they stay at one place in Vihara and monastery and pray. So they actually for three months, they just stay at one place in Vihara or uh, monastery and pray. So that, you know, now there is a end of such particular program. So that's called as Abhidhamma day. So this is also going to be, you know, held at uh, one of the temples in uh, Kushinagar. So let's see Swadesh Darshan scheme. So what is Swadesh Darshan scheme? Swadesh Darshan scheme is a scheme of Ministry of Tourism under Government of India. The scheme aims to promote, develop and harness the politic potential of tourism in India. So this is a central sector scheme that is 100% funded by Central Government of India. Also, efforts are made to achieve cover, you know, convergence with other schemes of central and state governments. The funding available for uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives of central public sector undertakings and corporate sector is also used in the scheme. So funding actually comes from CSR and, uh, you know, the central uh, public sector undertakings and corporate sectors is also, you know, uh, is the part of the scheme, like the funding of the scheme is done with this. The entire scheme is based on uh, theme based uh, tourism. Each theme is called a circuit and composed of various tourist destinations. So they're going to make different circuits of different themes and each theme is called as one particular circuit. Tourist circuit is defined as, now let's see what is tourist circuit. I told you, so it is based on one common theme. So let's see precisely a route having at least three major tourist destinations. So that should have at least three major tourist destinations, which are distinct and apart. Circuits should have well-defined entry and exit points. A tourist who enters should get motivated to visit most of the places identified in the circuit. A circuit could be confined to a state. So it can be within a state or could be a regional circuit covering more than one state or union territory. So it might be you know, connecting more than one state or even the union territories. These circuits may have one dominant theme and other sub themes. As I told you before, they should have one dominant theme and they can have also have other sub themes. So projects under the scheme shall be under the following identified themes. Now, which are all the common identified themes? Number one, ecotourism, wildlife, Buddhist, then desert, spiritual, Ramayana, Krishna, coastal, then Northeast, rural, Himalayan, tribal and heritage. So these are the common themes that are designed under the scheme. So now let's see what is Prashad scheme. So this is actually the national mission on uh, pilgrimage, rejuvenation and spiritual augmentation drive. So this was launched by the Ministry of Tourism in the year 2014-15 with the objective of holistic development of identified pilgrimage, pilgrimage destinations. The projects identified under this scheme shall be implemented through the identified agencies by the respective state or union territory governments. So with this, uh, let's see the objectives of uh, Prashad. So number one, rejuvenation and spiritual augmentation of important national or global pilgrimage, pilgrimage and you know, heritage sites. Follow community-based development and create awareness among the local communities. Integrated uh, tourism development of heritage city, local arts, culture, handicrafts, cuisine, etc. to generate livelihood. Strengthen the mechanism for bridging the infrastructure, infrastructural gaps. So these are the main objectives of Prashad scheme. So with this, let's go to the article number two. China denies testing hypersonic missile. So China's government denied a recent report saying it had carried out a test of a nuclear capable hypersonic missile stating that the launch was a routine test of a space vehicle but not nuclear capable hypersonic missile 
The Chinese Foreign Ministry, however, denied the report, as we understand spokesperson Zhao Lijian, Lijian said this was a routine test of space vehicle to verify technology of spacecraft's reusability. So this reusability is of great significance to reducing the cost of using space vehicle and providing a convenient and cheap way for mankind's two-way transmit you know, transportation in peaceful use of space. So this is the claim that they are saying, that they are saying they have not tested, you know, nuclear capable hypersonic missile. Instead, they have uh, done a routine test on space vehicle for its reuse. The Financial Times quoted, let's see what Financial Times quoted, you know, quoted security experts as saying the test was conducted in August. It noted that the China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, which carries out launches, so this is actually in China, usually carries out launches, that is China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, had in July announced its 77th launch of a long, you know, March rocket. So in, uh, you know, July, they had announced that they launched long March rocket. It was the 77th launch. And in the end of August said it had carried out 79th, you know, flight, 79th flight spark, you know, sparking speculations about a secretive 78th launch that had not been reported. So they had reported 77th launch and they had reported 79th launch and conspicuously the 78th launch was missing. So this is where the speculations of, uh, you know, this particular uh, hypersonic missile launch was actually guessed. So with this, let's go to article number three, trade talks between India and Israel to resume. So India and Israel agreed to resume long pending negotiations on a free trade agreement, that is FTA, as external affairs minister S. Jay Shankar met his Israeli counterpart, Yair Lapid in uh, Jerusalem. So both also joined a virtual quadrilateral meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony B. Lincoln and UAE Foreign Minister Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayad. The quadrilateral meeting seen as an outcome of last year's Abraham Accord brokered by the USA. So in this article, we will also understand what is Abraham Accords that is actually brokered by USA that saw the UAE and Israel establish diplomatic relations. So Abraham Lincoln is basically establishing uh, diplomatic relations between UAE and Israel and also underlines India's uh, close relationships with both the West Asian countries and Washington. The uh, free trade agreement talks would begin in uh, November and uh, concluded uh, by June 20, conclude by June 2022. The push for an uh, FTA between the two countries is the latest in a series of attempts to negotiate a trade agreement over the past 14 years. Israel also announced uh, it would join the India-France-led International Solar Alliance. So we are talking about uh, ISA, ISA, that is International Solar Alliance. So Israel also announced that they are, you know, they would also join India-France-led India International Solar Alliance ahead of the next United Nations climate change uh, you know, conference of parties 26 summit in Glasgow this November. Uh, now let's understand what is Abraham Accord. The Abraham Accord between Israel, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain is uh, mediated by the USA. So USA actually mediated this uh, Abraham Accord. So that is in between Israel, basically United uh, Arab Emirates and Bahrain. So it is the first Arab-Israel peace deal in 26 years. So, you know, bringing Israel, the UAE and Bahrain together reflects their shared concern about Iran's rising influence. So this is actually kind of a counter uh, reacting to raising Iran's rising influence in the region and development of ballistic missiles. So this has been brokered by the USA. So as per the agreement, the UAE Bahrain will establish embassies and exchange ambassadors working together with Israel across a range of sectors, including uh, tourism, trade, healthcare, and security. The Abraham Accord also opened the door for uh, Muslims around the world to visit the historic sites in Israel and to peacefully pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque 
in uh, Jerusalem, the third holiest site in Islam. So in the Islamic tr uh, tradition, Mecca is considered the holiest site, followed by the Prophet's mosque in uh, Medina and Al-Aqsa mosque in Jerusalem. So first uh, sacred place is considered to be Mecca. So this is the holiest and uh, the third holiest site in Islam is Al-Aqsa. It is there in uh, Jerusalem. So it is now open for the uh, Muslims community. So this is what is the Abraham Accord. So with this, let's go to article number four, India, Israel, UAE and US launch quad forum. So India, Israel, United Arab Emirates and United States have decided to launch a new quadrilateral economic forum. So this is basically the economic forum. So earlier we had quad with uh, US, Japan, uh, Australia, that was strategic dialogue. So the quadrilateral, which followed bilateral meeting, uh, you know, builds ongoing cooperation between the US, Israel and UAE after Abraham Accords last year and the and the India, Israel and the UAE cooperation that was launched since. So the grouping had decided to establish an international forum for economic cooperation. The main objective of this is to have international forum for economic cooperation and specifically discuss possibilities for joint infrastructure projects. So they actually discussed possibilities of joint infrastructure projects and expanding economic and political cooperation in the Middle East and Asia, including uh, through trade, combating climate change, energy cooperation and increasing maritime security, as well as ways to counter the COVID-19 pandemic. So these are all the main areas under which they will be concentrating as a quadrilateral association. With this, let's go to article number five. European Union food recall linked to genetically modified rice from India. So when candy giants Marsh Wrigley carried out a mass recall of several batches of its crispy MMS across Europe this August, it was due to use of one ingredient that is rice flour with genetically modified contamination that allegedly originated in India, according to notification on the European Commission's rapid alert system. So as for the notification given by European Commission's rapid alert system, they withdrew this product because of the contamination. They claim that it is from the genetically modified rice sourced from India. However, our ministry like Commerce, um, Commerce Ministry pointed out that GM rice is not grown commercially in India. The ministry alleged that the case was a futile conference to malign the image of India as a you know, reliable food security provider. So this is a futile exercise. That means useless, useless exercise or the conspiracy to malign our image before other nations. But India is one of the reliable food security provider. So worried farmers, uh, groups and uh, environmental activists, however, noted that multiple GM rice varieties had been approved for confined field trials only. So in India, it is not grown commercially. I mean to say the genetically modified rice is not grown you know, commercially. So these uh, crops are only confined to field trials itself and uh, warned that any cross-contamination could dampen the country's agricultural export ambitions. So India's annual rice exports amount to 18 million tons with worth of 65,000 crore and reach more than 75 countries according to the ministry. So European Union food recall linked to GM rice from India is uh, kind of an allegation. It is going to impact our, uh, you know, the export uh, because it is one of the greatest exports in India as it amounts to 65,000 crores every year. So these are all the articles of the day. And uh, if you just look at the map here, you can see these are all the top countries from, uh, you know, to which India actually exports rice, you know, starting from Netherlands highest, then we have Russia, Italy, Belgium, and Germany. So these are all the values worth uh, rice that is being transported, uh, you know, uh, exported in the year, financial year 2021. So this shows how significant the export uh, value of rice is for India. So with this, we are concluding all the, uh, you know, 
uh, the articles for uh, 20th and 21st of October. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put in comment box. We will be more than happy to answer to your questions. Thanks for watching. Namaskara.